I'm D. Watkins with Salon Talks, and today I'll be joined by Emmy Award winning producer, writer, director, and creator of Everybody Loves Raymond, Phil Rosenthal. We'll be talking about the seventh season of his Netflix show, Somebody Feed Phil. This guy has the best job in the world. Thank I you. agree. Thank you for taking time to, um, to hang with us. Welcome Thank to the show. Thank you. Congratulations on the new season. Um, I'm fascinated by food. I'm fascinated by travel and I just I, I love seeing the way you engage with people. I love that you are um, enjoying yourself. Um, something that, that I think about a lot when I'm watching you, something that um, kind of bothers me a little bit is, is so he's a pretty fit guy. He has all this great food. How much can he consume? <laughs> That's the number one question, by the way, I get. But you were nice about it. Like I, I do these shows where I go on tour and I talk to audiences and I love mm -hmm. doing that. And a little five-year-old girl got up to the mic and she said, may I ask you a question? And I said, of course, dear, what is it? She goes, how come you're not fat? <laughs> so I'll tell you what I tell her, which is, you know how they make a dog food commercial? They no. don't feed the dog until the commercial. Oh, wow. So I'm the dog. You only eat for work. I only eat. <laughs> So I know, I know it sounds crazy, but let's say we're in town for a week. That's how long it takes to shoot the show. One week in each place. You see me eating a lot, but that's all I ate that day was that scene. And then the next right up against it is the next scene. So it looks like I just go eating to mm. eating to eating. But that's probably the next day. Mm. Maybe we will do two scenes in a day, but... That's how I do it. And the rest of the time I'm walking or working out or doing, you know, this doesn't happen by itself. <laughs> you know, you have to cover a lot in a day. That's so right. what happens if you eat something that yeah. is so fucking good, yeah. but you know you have to save space? Yeah, I'm not good at that. <laughs> if it's the best thing. So, so usually you hit on something. That's the other secret. I don't finish anything because I know a lot is coming. So unless it is the best thing I ever ate, I'm not finishing that. Plus, by the way, the crew, they're looking at me while I'm eating these delicious things. They're looking at me like this. <laughs> so I share it with them. Yeah, the crew's always hungry. But I love to share it with them. It's fun to share it with them. It's only good if you can share it. Mm -hmm. That's really like a philosophy. Mm -hmm. You could be, you just talked about being alone in the restaurant, and yet you FaceTimed your wife mm -hmm. because you wanted to at least share this experience with her. It's only good if you can share it. And put me in a doghouse. Because <laughs> we haven't, we've been in New York like three times um, yeah. since then. Um, and we haven't been to Tatiana yet. So it's like, right. um, that's but one of those. Right now here, I want you to tell your wife you're taking her. <laughs> I'm taking you to Tatiana. Phil's going to pay for it. She's worth it. <laughs> Wait, so, I missed something. <laughs> so this season, you, you go to DC, um, which is uh, made me extremely happy because yes. uh, I live near DC and yes. I, I got some places to add to the list. You go to Iceland, yeah. You go to Dubai, Mumbai, Kyoto, Scotland, and more. Um, yes. Is there a common thread between these cities? Uh, they all have amazing food. I mean, we even went to Orlando, and I was not expecting much. I was expecting right. Epcot, right? Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing about Disney. They've been there 50 years. They have employed tens of thousands of immigrants. Mm. The immigrants have set up their own communities, cultures, and brought their food with them, their cuisines. And so it's like a mini New York or a mini LA where you have all these neighborhoods of, of different uh, places from around the world. Right. So it's phenomenal. So we call them that the real Orlando. And we don't set foot in the park. You kind of do that in Dubai as well. That's right, right? You because you expect... Away from, yeah. You expect just, you know, you drive down the street in Dubai and you go, oh, this, this is what it would be like if Vegas had real money. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> right. That's so built up. It's so modern and, and kind of spectacular. But I thought it was going to be all casino food or, or hotel food. Mm -hmm. And then there's old Dubai. And that's a city of immigrants. That's over 80% immigrants. So amazing Indian food. Amazing. I, I had one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever had just in my life mm -hmm. was a meal with a Palestinian woman who made me food from her hands and gave it to me. I got emotional. This was before all the troubles. But I'm telling you, there was a real connection there, real like a spiritual almost. And I'm not one of these woo-woo guys, right, right. but I felt something so powerful 
and we just we're friends and that's Beautiful. how it can be and how it should be I, I think about um, places like New York I, I think about different cities all over um, the country when you when you made this statement you walk into Mumbai it's the episode where you experienced the market and you said something that was very interesting I'm going to quote you um, people said I need to be able to experience all of life at once rich pure I mean rich poor beautiful crazy overwhelming and um, I thought it was such a beautiful way to illustrate that part of the journey. I just wanted if you could elaborate on what you experienced just walking in. Okay, so Mumbai, they call it maximum city because mm. it's more like we, we're sitting here in New York now. New York is maybe the center of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. But I swear to you, I'm from here. I never saw more hustle and bustle <laughs> in my life. I mean, imagine being dropped into Times Square at midnight, only it's summer and it's hot and every manner of transportation in the world is going through it at the same time that it's packed with people. And I mean everything from a tuk-tuk to a scooter to a bus to a cow mm -hmm. <laughs> to a rickshaw to a everything, everyone honking. Every, it's absolutely overwhelming and yet nobody's mad. Mm. Nobody's angry. They're honking just to say, I'm here, I'm here. There's no traffic lights. No, that scene with those smiling faces was so beautiful. They're yeah, so, so beautiful. friendly and sweet, no matter the stature of the person. Meaning you'd see the same smile on a very poor person as you would with a very rich person. They're happy people. It, it's amazing. And I didn't see, I was so worried about uh, the poverty that I would see there. Mm. How do you do your light little fun travel show right. when people are suffering, but I didn't see suffering. I did see poor people, but I didn't see suffering. I see more suffering here, mm -hmm. right? And they're, ju they're just gorgeous and friendly and outgoing. I tell you, it, the best thing about travel is it changes your perspective. So here I was afraid to go. I didn't know how to show it, how to justify it. One way to justify it is when you go, you try to help a little bit. Okay. Right? Absolutely. So you try to make each place that you visit a tiny bit better than you found it. So that's important to me. By the way, the other thing I was afraid of in Mumbai was everyone I know who went has gotten uh, sick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for Just sure. Because we're not used to the water. We're not used to different uh, stuff in the food. Well, you're seven seasons in, so I imagine yeah. that like you're... Your stomach is, uh, you evolved physically. I think, I think I, my stomach can handle a lot, but everyone I knew got sick. So what, I, I just, they said, you gotta be extra careful. You gotta not only brush your teeth with bottled water, you have to rinse your toothbrush then mm. in bottled water to make sure. And so I was super careful and didn't get sick. There was one place I got sick in the whole history of the show. You know where it was? San Francisco. San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know from what, because I ate a lot that day, and I don't know what it was. Yeah, I, I got sick when I went to Egypt, but what I will say, what I will say is that I lost like 15 pounds. So hey, there you like go. That. There's always a bright side. <laughs> so, so your body has changed um, from, from eating all of these different places. Um, how have you changed as a person? What has this show done to Phil Rosenthal and the man? I love that question. Uh, the way I sold the show first to PBS and then to Netflix, as a one line. I said, I'm exactly like Anthony Bourdain if he was afraid of everything. <laughs> and I meant it. I mean, that's not just funny. It's really, no. I, I watched he was, he was fearless. Superhero, yeah. right? Like the, the, like the best. But I would watch him and I would go, that's amazing. I'm never doing that. I'm never eating a bowl of blood soup. I'm like. not doing that. I'm not going in the dune buggy. I'm not going to a war, uh, a country at war to get shot at. I'm not doing right, it. Right. And then I thought there must be, maybe there's a show for people like me who are even afraid to get, get leave the house. You know, just the, that's a step out of their comfort zone is getting off the couch. And I thought if, if I did some of these things, if I just made a move in the right direction, two thirds of Americans don't even have a passport. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. They don't want to go anywhere. They don't want to try stuff. So I thought if I at least tried stuff, maybe that's a big step for other people. That's so great. That's what's so great about the show is that um, most people are scared. 
you know, you sit down at a dinner table and you give them something they're not comfortable with. They're That's like, right. you know, and that, you're giving those people like energy to be able to try more. That's which is, it. Which is great work as well. That's it. And how it changed me was the more I do it, the less afraid I am. Why? Because our biggest fear is the unknown. But if you do something that you were afraid of, now it's at least known to you. doesn't mean I'm going to do it every time again, but it, I'm a tiny bit braver than when we started. So you were pretty convincing on the Dubai episode when you said this is like the best burger you ever had. And, you know, ruined burgers. For you me. know, you got to go. If you want a burger, you have to literally get on a plane and go to Dubai. Um, it is amazing how sometimes that outside, the outsider, he's not American. He didn't grow up with burgers. But sometimes that point of view from outside has the best view. So this is the hardest question I'm going yeah. to ask. Yeah. This is the most difficult question. Um, and this is also, you know, this is more of a personal question. Yes. So I'm, I'm taking advantage I'm of this opportunity. Of everywhere you went in season seven, yeah. if you got to go back to one city to re-eat your way through that city, mm -hmm. which one would it be? Kyoto. Okay. Easy. You Easy. ever been to Japan? Easy. I've never been to Japan. There's something about it. I, I, my wife is with me on four of these episodes of the eight. And it's really nice. And, but when we got to Kyoto... It was so beautiful, so serene. That's not a word I throw around a lot because mm -hmm. we're talking about Mumbai and New York. Mm -hmm. These are not serene yeah. places. This, you go there and it is just like, like this. So Japan was bombed during World War II. They bombed almost every city. Kyoto, they didn't touch. So there's over 2,000 ancient temples and shrines still there in Kyoto. Imagine walking around the city and finding not just like a temple, but the, all the grounds of the temple, all the manicured, beautiful uh, trees and forests. I, my, my, it's a joke, but you go to a pharmacy in Japan and you buy a pack of gum, they wrap it for you as if it's for your 100th birthday. Oh my God. I mean, it's crazy the level of detail that, and care that's taken in every aspect of life, including the food. So let's say we want dumplings tonight, right? Mm -hmm. You don't just go to a restaurant that has dumplings. You go to the dumpling place with 10 seats. That's all they do. And are they the best dumplings you ever had in your life? Yes. You want noodles? What kind of noodles? You want the soba noodles or the udon noodles? Because that depend that's going to determine which restaurant you go to. So we go to the soba noodle place, all they serve there is cold soba noodles with some dipping sauce. One of the best meals I ever had in my life. So it's like after leaving a place like Mubai, Kyoto might be the yes. place to reset. I'll say. Mm. Or just reset from anywhere else in the world. There's wow. nothing like it. I never, I've never, I was there on the first day, I was sad because I knew I only had a week there. Mm. On the first day. On wow. the first day, I go, wow, I'm going to hate to leave this place. Yes. So you, you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, how food brings everyone together. Yes, um, it's the great I, connector. I, I think about um, how separate, how separated, how divisive our country is right now. Yeah, and food is something that we all have in common, something yep. that we all share. Um, is there a way for us to use food to heal us? Did you see the DC episode yet? I did see the DC episode. So you know what happens at the end of that episode? It was yes. something I had in mind. When we went to DC, I was saying, I wonder if I can make this are we, happen. Are we doing spoilers? It's okay. We'll just say we're getting Democrats and Republicans together there you at go. Maketo. <laughs> you got it. I didn't. That was not easy. I, I couldn't find a Republican and a Democrat to come and sit and have a meal with me because they didn't want to be together. What the hell? But then I did. It's crazy. Brian Fitzpatrick, uh, who's a... Republican congressman from Pennsylvania, and Pete Buttigieg, our Secretary of Transportation. Uh, and they sat and they were fantastic. And they serve on a committee that I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. It's called the Bipartisanship Committee. And when I asked them, what do you think is the biggest problem in our country faces today? They said it was bipartisanship. And that makes total sense. I thought it would be guns or climate change or whatever so many problems, but none of the problems will get fixed unless the two sides talk. 
And a good way to get people to talk is to sit down and eat something together. Maybe next season you can get uh, Mitch McConnell to uh, play a game of basketball with Al Sharpton. <laughs> and you like referee. And then everybody <laughs> eats together. I'll pay, I'll pay to see that. I said put a buffet in Congress. Maybe we get some. Because you can't hate somebody if you're eating with them. I really don't think so. Because right away we're doing something that we all do that's known to Look, us. Look, I'm in my mind right now, like, yo, who do I hate that I had to eat with? I'm just like, it's... <laughs> even if you hate them... And I can't but think. Even I can't if you hate them going in, I swear you'll feel a little better with them once you do something completely relatable with them. Right? You can't help it. Oh, look, we're at least, at the very least, human beings who like to eat. Mm -hmm. And if the food is good, it puts you in a better mood. Absolutely. And if you can share a smile or a laugh with the person, now we're friends and we might eat again. So to me, I'm not just using food as like this fun thing. I actually think it's important. You've had success in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, how does it feel about being in front of the camera at this phase of your career? Uh, it's amazing to be this age and wake up and find yourself Taylor Swift. <laughs> You're having a lot of fun with it. Of course. And you get to work with your wife and son, which is I also I do, amazing. and my daughter, too. And In fact, daughter, I wrote a daughter. kid's book with my daughter that's coming out this week, too, called Just Try It. And it's exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not just for little kids, either. Trying to get... It's, the book is about a dad who eats everything, this little girl who won't try anything. But how many adults do you know that won't try stuff? It's too many. Right? Too many. It's really about just having a little bit of an open mind. That's all it is. And wouldn't the world be better if we just tried new things or tried to talk to new people? I definitely want to say um, rest in peace to, to Richard Lewis. Um, oh, we're, we're what big, a great guy. We're big Curb fans yeah. around here. And I do think our fans want to know, Yes. When the, when the fuck did you do to Larry to the point where he wouldn't want to have lunch with Phil? Hysterical. That was crazy. I love that. <laughs> uh, I didn't do anything to him, but he understands that we are opposite personalities. Like the name of my show would be Why Curb Your Enthusiasm? <laughs> so for someone positive and, and uh, someone who loves other people, that could be annoying to a guy like Larry. So he doesn't want to sit with me. He's worried that I was going to ask him to be on my show. And of course, the first thing I do when I see him is, hey, you got to do my show. <laughs> you want to go to Ethiopia? Do you like coffee? And he's like, oh. <laughs> No, he had this great bet on destination weddings. I fucking hate destination weddings. Like, I've never don't invite seen me to a destination wedding. He said for a wedding, you shouldn't have to travel more than like 10 miles. I, or you don't got to go. I can't say <laughs> that he's wrong. I was once invited to a bar mitzvah on an Alaskan cruise to Alaska. That That's horrible. a weak commitment. <laughs> That's a big commitment. <laughs> on a cruise ship. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a memoirist, I write a whole lot about um, my life, uh, what happened in the past, what's going on, projections in the future. And um, I heard you talk about Everybody Loves Raymond was drawn from Ray's life and parts of your life. And yes. I was always, um, and it's very personal. Yes. Um, what are some of the key parts for you when building like a story just around those um, things, those personal things that happened to you and within your relationships. I think it's the key to everything. I think uh, you, you know this because you're a writer. Don't you find that when you get really down to the specifics of a situation, something that happened to you, and you describe it in your own personal way, that that's when you start connecting with people. Absolutely. Because even if your specifics aren't mine, I'm going to relate to it because I deal in specifics too. And that's what gets us... Uh, you know, connected to, to each other, is those specifics. So that's really the secret. I tell everyone, you all have a story in you. Mm -hmm. All we are is a collection of everything that's happened to us filtered through the way we think. And that's what makes us each individual and each valuable story-wise. Absolutely. Right? Would you write another sitcom? Sure. Sure I would. By the way, right after Raymond, I tried to write a sitcom every year, nobody wanted it. That's why I have to do this, food and travel. 
but we're happy that we get to see you and we know Thanks. when it's the time is right one would come thanks again for coming Thank on the show you, my friend congratulations wow, what a pleasure. On, congratulations on the new season Thank you. I have new places to go to in DC maybe as soon as tomorrow let's see <laughs>